Good evening from Boston College. I'm Bert Howell, and I'm the Executive Director of Intersections. I welcome you to the show at six, BC and the Common Good. The show at six features friends and members of the BC community discussing a range of issues affecting our world today, all revolving around the theme of the common good. Topics include how the BC community is responding to the effects of COVID-19, to the enduring challenges of the marginalized, to our own resiliency and solidarity, and to the upbuilding of human dignity throughout the world. The show is based on the central insight of the common good. That is that the resources that humanity has and needs must be shared equitably. For instance, today each of us is called to promote the common good by social distancing, by wearing masks, by washing our hands. These practices, like other forms of solidarity, are not only for our own good, but for the common good. In many of the previous segments, we've heard repeatedly about the disparities in healthcare, employment, and education that lead African Americans and Latinx neighbors to be much more at risk to the pandemic. At the same time, the brutal killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Rashard Brooks, and George Floyd highlight all the more how white privilege, anti-blackness, and other forms of racism endanger the lives of our brothers and sisters. We are at BC, a Jesuit Catholic school, committed to becoming men and women for others. We know that through solidarity and a commitment to the common good, we can beat the virus of COVID-19, but we must be no less committed to defeating the virus of racism that destroys the lives of so many. At 6.40 this evening, my co-host and I will ask our guests questions from the audience. Members of the audience can pose a question before 6.40 p.m. via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Let me repeat that. Members of the audience can pose a question before 6.40 p.m. via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. They should identify themselves by their name and relationship to BC. I'm delighted to co-host this segment tonight with the Kuasar. She is the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Academic Affairs at Boston College. A former Fulbright Scholar, she is the author of The Histories, Languages, and Cultures of West Africa. And she is also the author of Black Women Writers, Contributions to Contemporary Feminist Discourse. Akua? Thank you, Bert, and welcome this evening, everyone. I am going to introduce our panelists tonight, and I'm going to start with um, Yvonne McBarnett, who's also known as Ms. Smiley. Yvonne has been at Boston College since 2002 in various roles at the Thea Bowman Ahana and Intercultural Center at University Advancement, and since 2015, the Montserrat Coalition, where she was appointed director in 2018. Yvonne is a double eagle with both her bachelor's degrees from the Woods College of Advancing Studies, and she is also a BC mom. Then we also have Marina Pastrana. Marina graduated from the Carroll School of Management in 2008 with a major in accounting and a minor in Latin American studies, and she has a master's degree in theological studies from BC School of Theology and Ministry. Marina founded the Montserrat Coalition in 2010 as a holistic approach to supporting the needs of low socioeconomic students outside of the traditional models of financial aid. And finally, we have Juan Concepcion, who is legal counsel for Boston Scientific Corporation Juan has many years of experience in labor and employment litigation, workplace compliance, and strategic workforce management. A rare quadruple eagle, Juan earned a bachelor's degree, a master's of education, a JD, and an MBA from Boston College. He serves on the board of trustees, and he also has an appointment as an adjunct professor in African and African diaspora studies. Welcome to all of our distinguished guests. Juan, I'm going to start with you um, with our first question and you can start us off. Uh, Juan, you graduated, I believe your first degree from Boston College was in 1996. And I'm wondering if you can share with us for a few minutes 
just a little bit about your experience at Boston College. Um, I believe you came to BC from New York City. Um, you were a first generation college student, a low income college student. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us for a few minutes about what your experience was like back in the day, back in the 90s before the Montserrat Coalition. Sure, thank you for that. Um, very pleased to be part of this panel. Um, so when I think back to a time when Montserrat was not part of the Boston College experience, I think about a time when many of us coming from neighborhoods where we face a lot of health disparities, um, a lot of food insecurity, there were problems in our communities that um, left everyone wondering how people could even survive. I was one of those, uh, one, one of the lucky ones that, that was able to get an opportunity to go to Boston College. Now, as you mentioned, uh, the first time that I was on at BC was in 92. That was my the beginning of my freshman year. And I have to say that at that point, Boston College historically had had experience with a critical mass of Black, Latino, Asian, Native American students at that point for about maybe 20, 25 years in critical masses. There had been students before at BC, uh, before 1969. But at that point, BC was still, I think, institutionally learning um, how to really um, address the needs of this student population, which brought with them a, a significantly different and exceptional set of needs. And so there I was as a student from, as you mentioned, New York City, Washington Heights, um, you know, uh, I had come from a single parent home. I had lived in the Fort Washington houses, um, a, uh, you know, the projects ran by the uh, New York City Housing Authority. I came with a um, few things that I owned at that point. Um, I came to BC really looking for opportunity. Now, I have to be fair in how I'm gonna describe the university because quite frankly, a lot of universities were on the same boat as, as Boston College. So I found BC to be, you know, looking back, to be less diverse than the university is right now, less inclusive as well. And I have to thank Marina for her vision in bringing us a program like Montserrat that was able to really bring together resources at the institutional level that had been at, for some time, for a long time, quite frankly, disjointed. And, and, and we're unable to, because of that, we're unable to meet the needs of students like me. I remember the first time, for example, when I went to Lions Hall to get my, my ID card. I remember taking the photo. I remember this uh, very gentle lady uh, telling me to be very careful not to lose that card. Um, she said that card it will give you access to your books. It'll give you access to a lot of things, but more importantly than anything, she said, that's where, that's how you'll eat. That, that, that has money in it. Um, please don't lose that. And I remember walking out of that and I don't know why still to this day, I mean, I can imagine why, but for the first time in my life, um, as tears were running down my eyes, I felt that, um, somehow that food insecurity, that, 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 that uncertainty that had plagued my life was somehow beginning to change. And I really believe that that's what a lot of the students, the Montserrat students, um, are feeling today. I think that the program, um, without the program, a lot of us were left to really try to build ourselves. And sometimes it took some of us one year, some of us two, some of us never really got around to building that ramp that we can use to elevate ourselves. But yet, you, you know, you look around and you find that a lot of people were able to achieve. And so now with the Montserrat uh, Coalition, I'm very excited about where we are as a, as a, as a university. I mean, it's, for, for me, I, I came at BC at a point where I was invited. It's, it's almost like um, a good friend of mine described diversity and inclusion, the work around diversity and inclusion this way and I'm gonna extend it a little bit. She, she said that diversity in many ways is being invited to a party. <laughs> Inclusion is being asked to dance. What Montserrat does is it allows the person to actually make a request of the DJ. 
and to be able to tell, tell the caterer that you don't eat beef or chicken, you eat vegetables. <laughs> In many ways, that's why I love Montserrat. <laughs> Juan, I love that. I love that image. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful image, and it it really underscores the idea uh, that I was thinking about for my next question for Marina, really about conversation. Uh, you're describing a party, and I think that's you know that's that's where people get to interact face to face with each other. And Marina, you've really studied the conversation about social class in the United States from a very young age, um, and you realized early on that there is a taboo in the U.S around talking about social class, that there's pain. Uh, there's pain because there's moral judgment that's often involved in that conversation. So when you started Montserrat with Jack Butler and University of Mission and Ministry, you really kickstarted a conversation that had kind of been uh, pushed aside for too long. What were you hoping would happen when, when you started that? What benefits did you hope would occur when we as a community could more squarely and openly talk about social class? Yeah, I think what Juan mentioned about inclusion, what it means to be included, is hearing someone's authentic story in a way that honors their history and honors their value without attributing any shame to it. And I think in my own experience of going through my time at BC and how my perception of BC began to change was how I began to be included in that conversation. And for BC, in the very early days of Montserrat, before it had the name, and I was working with Hubert and with other people at the university, trying to find resources to give to students, because as, as Juan had said, a lot of those resources existed, but they were disjointed. And not only that, a student had to self-identify and then prove that they were worthy of this support. And, and that had happened to me as well. And it's never really an intentional conversation and that other party may not be aware of how that is shaming. But for me, it had been a jarring experience having to defend that I was low socioeconomic and deserving of these resources. And it was in engaging with students and asking them about their experience. So when we first began and started to give out some small end resources and just inviting students so that they could go to dances or could go to football games or could participate in retreats without having any stigma, it was also an opportunity to hear their story and ask them, what are the challenges that you're going to have? And then having those stories from pre-med students or English majors or nursing students and hearing where their pain points were, where their struggles, where their barriers were or where they were feeling really marginalized. And then being able to take that to the university and say, we know these are the challenges they're gonna face. And we know that as a community, we wanna support them let's figure out some strategies to support these students. And my hope, I mean, we're, to be honest, we're not there yet. We've come so far in where Montserrat is now, but there's still so much we can do as a university because we still need to listen to the new lived reality and new lived experience that students have on campus and determine where they're facing those barriers. But my hope, I mean, my hope would be that every Montserrat student graduates debt free because Student debt is still an issue that a lot of students face for many years after they leave Boston College. But my hope is that what this does is bring the community together and recognize that not everybody fits into this cookie cutter experience. And there are students that their lived reality on campus is different and we need to understand where they're standing and invite them into that conversation and also invite the, the people on the other side who may not have that lived experience and invite them into that journey for how they'll walk together and be part of that community to community together. So my hope was always that it's an ongoing conversation that's gonna continue to grow and continue to, to show students that Boston College A cares about them and B honors their authentic lived experience and wants to walk with them in that, in that journey. Thanks. Thanks so much, Maureen. I think, you know, what you and Juan are talking about is really belonging, you know, 
I think diversity is one step, you know, being invited to the party. Inclusion is, you know, being asked to dance and belonging is not only asking, you know, for, for fish instead of chicken, <laughs> but also dancing like, you know, like nobody's watching, you know, that's, right. that's, that's belonging. And so I want to go to um, Yvonne, who is the current director of the Montserrat um, Coalition. And can you tell us a little bit about some of the services the program provides to help students feel that sense of belonging at Boston College? Sure, thank you, Kua, and I'd be happy to. I want to thank my, my panelists and everyone that has joined us tonight. Thank you for allowing us to be in your space. And I am so happy that I'm a part of this party. And I'm going to tell you some of the things that when you come to the party, what's available for you. So definitely we're a social um, community. So let me start by saying there are now 2,246 200, 2, students wow. that are eligible to be a part of the Montserrat program. So I just wanted to state that first. Um, we have free resources of free tickets to the Pops and the Heights, free athletic gold passes. So all of our students are able to have that, as Marina mentioned. Um, free tickets to the <coughs> events, tickets to the Rob Sham plays, funding for club sports. There's spring break outdoor adventure trips that I have been invited to go for a, a couple of times, but they told me they don't shower for a week, so I opted out not to go. Um, the OIP study abroad information centers, we also have meet and greet luncheons, freshman wild eagle programs that we've partnered with the athletics department. 101 mentoring, which Marina alluded to, that the fact that you, in order to have a community, you need that mentoring. So we also make sure when we're advising our students, we do it holistically. We have funds for emergency and personal, um, personal funds for them to go home. We have funds for spring and winter break. Grocery gift cards, that's case by case. If a student is lacking of food, it, again, we spoke about food insecurity, there's um, an opportunity to get that from us. We have hangout with the staff luncheons. Now, when I started this, I said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. We're gonna order lunch and I invite about 25 to 30 students at a time to just come and sit and have conversation with us. Again, at that, those lunches, I found that the, the waistline was getting a little bigger. So now I'm ordering salads and I, or I ordered the real food for the students, but we have a great time doing that. We also have the Montserrat Dinner Club, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the Career Center liaison. So we have someone from the Career Center coming in, helping the students with their cover letters and, and resumes. We have an, an uh, OIP liaison. We also have internship T passes. So students that have T passes, we fund if when they're traveling back and forth, we have funding that we can reload their T passes. We have a laptop program. We've partnered with IT. We get about 15 laptops that our students can loan out during the semester. Once they return them, we have work study assistant program, a textbook learn, um, loan program. So we have a library in-house at 36 College Road with over 1,500 books that have been donated in the past to us. And all of our books are online, so the students are able to check out the books, see what we have, check it out and load it out for this entire semester. We also have retreat cost reduction for the Kairos, Menresa, Arupe, Appa, Mississippi Delta, DR trip, Jamaica, uh, Jamaica Magis, Israel, Palestine. And all this is done in collaboration with a network of offices, the athletics department, advancement, campus ministry, the nursing department, FYE, learning to learn, just to name a few. If it wasn't for them, they would, there would be no us. And I just want to highlight three more. The Monster Ag Dinner Club, that's only for sophomores where we're able to meet at the front of faculty dining room and they're having conversations with administrators and faculty that appeared with them to talk about their challenges that they're facing on campus. We also have joined in with the BC Clean. I've partnered with Res Life and the Sustainability Department that we're able to go in when there's a BC Clean and we're able to collect books, microwaves, fridges, and all of this, that all of the things that we collect is prepared for our incoming freshmen because as we all know that the first day of school there's this target trip and a lot of our students can't afford to go shopping so what did miss smiley do she partnered with these folks and said okay let's get to microwaves and, and fridges and and everything else that we can get to support our students so they can feel a part of 
and that has been so successful over the years, giving a shout out to Bruce Dixon and Jesse Graff in the Res Life and all the ones that worked in the, um, the other departments. And the last but not least, I would like to highlight is the Cross Current Seminar. And that is taught by our yours truly, Bert Howell. It's a one credit course that our students can actually uh, participate in. And the seminar looks at the consequences of economic inequality in the lives of high financial need undergrads studying at Elite Universities, Elite Universities, and they will apply what they've learned in other classes to their daily campus life. And what I like about this course, he actually invites myself and Jeremiah Jefferson, the assistant director, as guest speakers, we're, a, we're able to share our stories. And again, that's another highlight that I have to give him a shout out. He does a great job. Bert, I wanna be just like you when I grow up. Keep up the good work. And those, and that's in a nutshell of what we're doing now, Akua, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. You're welcome. Well, Yvonne, thank you for those kind words. And I have to say that the high, one of the highlights of the year, the semester for the students in that class is to hear from you and Jeremiah. Thank about you. Montserrat and all of the resources that are offered. I mean, it's really amazing how many um, opportunities Montserrat students have to engage with each other, with your office and with the university in, in, a, in a full way. Another thing that happens during that class I find is that students tell me that sometimes they feel, um, despite all the good things that are happening and that they're taking advantage of, like they're still fundamentally in a bind. Uh, and the, the bind is that when you talk about the number of Montserrat students, it's clear that um, it's not the majority of students, uh, that most students who go to Boston College are fairly well off. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes Montserrat students feel invisible, um, but they have a yearning to um, be acknowledged uh, because their story is often a story of real strength and real resiliency. Um, and yet when you make yourself vulnerable by telling your story, there's also the chance that you can be exploited especially when uh, the culture uh, in our world is full of racism. Mm -hmm. So the question that I have next is for all three panelists, because I know you've been thinking about this question for a long time and experiencing it and have good things to say. And that is, is there a way to tell your story that increases visibility, um, that recognizes resiliency and strength, um, but also preserves dignity? And I'd, I'd like Juan to go first and then I want to hear from Yvonne and then Marina will, will finish us off with that question. Thank you, Bert. So invisibility is one of the, one of the most um, oppressing things in that experience, right? I mean, as we've been discussing, we're talking about students who started out, most of them, in living lives that have been deprived of so many things. And one of the things that they've been deprived of is their, their dignity. Um, and when they go to Boston College and when they graduate, sometimes that doesn't change. Um, and so the best thing that we can do for people, which was done for me, is to allow me to go about my life without unnecessary adversity. I think much too, you know, too many times we, we find that, um, you know, people, that, people who don't understand the situation sometimes feel like they have to just let it be. It's sort of like benign neglect. In a situation like that, there's no room for that. I think there's just need for action. In particular, at a school like Boston College, um, we're guided by faith and action, right? Um, it's a kinetic kind of faith. We have to do. And so at Boston, at least, speaking at least for Boston College, I think that the way we can empower the students to really tell their story for the coming good is to give them the platform, to allow them, and to really give them the tools that they need to find that voice. Because many a times uh, what happens is uh, the students have a lot of great things to share with the rest of us, not only because they're survivors, but because their stories can really help us to survive as a community. Uh, those are really the courageous stories that, that are told, but very often unheard. And so what we need to do, I think, as a community is amplify those stories and really dignify them in a way that, um, that, places, that places those stories in the right context. And for me, Bert, that was a great question. And as 
Quan had just alluded to, stories can be very healing and many people benefit from getting the opportunity to pass on their wisdom to others. And this can be especially powerful for people, especially the mantra students, who don't always feel that they have the chance to help others. And resilience is strengthened by recognizing that we all are experts in our own. And I, when I'm invited to your class, it's, I'm proud to share my story because it's important to be transparent with these students. When they hear your story, they don't feel alone. Everyone can get better at creating sustaining resilience and all of us will experience some kind of adversity and most of us will go through some tough times at you know in points of our lives and we're remarkable at bouncing back and it's important for the students to know that we have the opportunity to bounce back because what in, what's important for me is having a mentor and that those mentors were able to help me to bounce back and it's important for these students especially at boston college to have that opportunity to get a, a, a mentor one important difference is a sense of well-being and people who have found their voice share their story and reaffirm their values. And oftentimes, in a sense, we get that peace and hopefulness that we didn't have before because we were able to share our stories and our voices were heard. Yeah, I definitely echo that. I think that, at least in my own experience, in sharing my story in front of students and in faculty, I felt it created a space for others to recognize themselves within parts of my story, but then also recognize that their own individual story was one of resilience, right? That resilience is one of the theme for tonight. And I think so often for, at least for Montserrat students that I spoke to over the years, their story carried a sense of wanting to hide all the struggle and in, and in sharing my story and saying it is hard you have overcome so much you you know you could be facing parents that are incarcerated or come from a single parent family or parents who don't have who are on long-term disability and as a young person many students that are in Montserrat have had to navigate extremely difficult and challenging situations that even adults would not be able to, to cope with. And they're doing this from a very young age. And in sharing these stories, it's never easy. I don't think it gets easier until perhaps you're on another stage of your life. But in that moment, being able to share with students my story and my struggle, that I wasn't a perfect student my first two years, that I didn't get great grades, that it took a lot of mentorship and support to get me to another place and say in an authentic way, this is me and I am being vulnerable and it is hard, but if you share with me and with the community, you have something to add. And in adding to the community and in bringing your story, you're adding your own resiliency to a new space. So if you participate, you are creating a new dynamic and a new conversation. And if we don't participate and we don't get to hear these stories, the university community is really missing so much wealth and richness from these students. And I think that that's what I would really say to anyone for every single person is facing their own internal struggle or journey and in sharing your story, whatever that may be, and whether you faced issues of race or socioeconomic or health or whatever situation you're in, learning how to share your story in a way that is empowering to you is gonna be enriching to any community that you're a part of. And it's so crucial and necessary. Wow. Thank you, everyone. That's great. You know, Bird had started off the, the conversation talking about, you know, being in this pandemic, um, the recent uh, racist uh, murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. And you know, uh, and we all know that COVID-19 is impacting black and brown people and people, uh, poor people um, at a much uh, higher rate. Um, and so it's hard to be resilient right now, you know? Um, I think um, 
it's hard to feel hopeful right now. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, what advice do you have for, for, for students right now that are experiencing this and, and that are having, we're, we're all, this is a really difficult time right now, but particularly difficult for black and brown people and, and poor people. And what sort of advice would you have for students to remain hopeful? I would say, and, and I'm gonna borrow um, a, a constant statement that I always hear my very good friend, Dan Bunch, always say, you have to advocate for yourself. You, you have to speak up. It's okay to, to need someone, to need something. It's okay. And we have to, we owe it to ourselves as a community, really build a community where that's okay. Because believe it or not, um, you know, one of the, one of the uh, toughest things that I had to face was having a student who was homeless. I was teaching this student and he was the only, he, he would only attend my class, I later found out because he liked me. And I remember that there was a, an issue with an assignment and I kind of, trying to be the instructor, I try, I, I try to be a little firm with him. And then, and then I noticed that he stopped coming. You know, um, I wish that that student would have given me an inkling mm. as to what was going on in his life. He was, he was homeless, mm. you know, but by the same token, I wish that I would have been better. I wish that I would have, instead of insisting on the academics, I would have given a little bit more and actually invited him to probably a meal and try to figure out what was going on. And that's, and that's really um, what I would say to, to the faculty, but also to the students. We need to engage in these discussions. We need to be okay with saying we need things. <laughs> Go ahead, Marina, what do you think? Yeah, you thanks, know, Juan. You know, a lot of, when I was trying to get Montserrat launched, it was also during, um, right after 2008, the re recession, and a lot of people thought that working for this for change, getting an institution like Boston College to not only accept, but fund and institutionalize a program like Montserrat would be unheard of, especially at a time where there were hiring freezes. And maybe it's youth <laughs> that <laughs> makes you think that anything is possible. But I would say to students that they have so much power. They have so much power to change the way their communities reflect on and work toward change and really pushing the boundaries of, of, of holding people and institutions to a higher level of compassion and justice and inclusivity and equity. And students, regardless of who they are or where they are, they are in a space where they can dedicate time and themselves and their studies to these endeavors. And even though it's a pandemic, you're at home, you can call, you can email, you can tweet, <laughs> you can Instagram, you can do all these things and you can connect and build, there's a, you can build connections to people. And there's a reason why Montserrat is called the Montserrat Coalition because it was a community effort of really connected individuals who felt this was the right thing to do who had either started somewhere different and come along the path or initially when they met me or when they met the group that was working on this really resonated with the project but it's about building those connections and students you have the time you have the space and you have each other and you also have an institution that no matter where it is or what it's doing you can hold to a, to a higher standard because of who we say we are. And Boston College is a Jesuit institution that believes in serving others and men and women for others. And you can hold us accountable to that. And you can hold your community accountable to that. If we say we are something, then let's push this institution or push our communities to that better place. And there's nobody better to do it than young people. Thank Thanks you, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and for me, 
uh, Akua, what I'm sharing, what I'm currently sharing with the students, the story that I'm sharing with them is you're not alone. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard. It's hard to be hopeful. But I also, the conversations that I've been having on Zoom, we start talking about the values. And I'm, I'm always speaking about and referring to my grandmother mm -hmm. that always was always there for me, my hardships and everything that I went to. And she always would look at me and say, baby, you going to be someone. It's going to be all right, no matter what you <laughs> go through. And I, you know, I constantly remind these students, we have life, we have breath, we're still in spite of everything, in the midst of everything that we're going through, we're still blessed. We may not be where we were. We may not be where we want. We may not, we're not, we are not where we want to be, but we know where we want to go. And when you think about your values and, and what the dignity and, and what you've been through, and for me, what keeps me going is my family. Mm -hmm. And family brings a lot to the table. And, and if it wasn't for my family, I wouldn't be sitting on this panel today. So when the, the conversations that I have with the students, whatever you call family, those are the people that you need to be connected with. And I like what Marina just alluded to. You have a voice. When I COVID kept us in, George Floyd got us out. And when I look at all the protesting, guess what? There are students out there. So the same power that you have to hold up a sign, Black Lives Matter, have the same voice at your university say that I need your help from your administrators, from the faculty, hold me accountable. I'm always drinking tea, so let's do this. <laughs> and, you know, have those conversations because it's important to be authentic with each other because we're not alone. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you to all of you for, for answering that question. And I can really resonate and attest to Boston College before and after Montserrat and quite frankly, mission and ministry. Because I think it's very interesting and important that we recognize that Montserrat is squarely located within university mission and ministry. And really from the day one when Marina started it to now when Yvonne is, is, is the director, it's really been a ministry to students. It's really been a sense of how do we as an institution live into our ideal of the common good. Uh, and, and I can say, just as a person who, who stepped foot on this campus in 1991 and, and now has been here 29 years, uh, like Juan in the 90s, it was different. It was a great place. It was a place that cared about the common good. But now I can honestly say we're living into that more uh, because of resources like Montserrat and the ability for community members to contribute and engage as a student an administrator, a faculty member, a trustee, uh, a parent. Uh, there's more opportunities now. And, and I think that's been a, a, a unique thing. And I think it's, it's very timely and apt uh, that we're talking about the common good uh, in this series and that Montserrat's uh, a, a big part of that. Um, I think we're now going to go to uh, questions uh, from the audience. And why don't, I, um, why don't I start now by asking a question uh, uh, from an anonymous uh, a person uh, in the audience. And it is this, um, Montserrat is uh, able in many ways to help students prepare for work life. And I actually wanna direct this question to Juan because you've had, you've had a, a, a lot of experience uh, in, in the work world, in the corporate world, uh, in, in law and other, in other areas. Uh, sometimes there's a feeling that Montserrat students have of being between worlds. Uh, where they're very grateful for more economic stability, but at the same time, they may feel that they've been moved away from their home community or their family. Juan, how do you deal with that, um, with the pressure uh, that's on you and other people who are low income who then go into the workforce and, and do quite well as you have done? Uh, thank you, Bert. So the way I would answer that is this way. Sure, there, there have been many achievements along the way, but there have also been stumbling blocks. And those are some of the things that um, I can I can attest to to here today, right? A lot of people wouldn't believe that um, for some time, due to the economic downturn of 2008, I found myself for two years without an uh, without an opportunity. So I had to create my own opportunity, and it was very and it was really unsettling, right? Because four degrees from Boston College should have assured me um, a situation where I wouldn't face unemployment. But the reality is, is that a Boston College degree can do a lot of great things, but it won't keep you away. It won't insulate you from, from reality. 
you are going to keep, you know, if, when you come from families like mine and from the Montserrat students who, who have families with, with a lot of unmet need, even when you're succeeding, your focus is on them. You're not thinking about a yacht. You're not thinking about the latest BMW that just came out. You love those things, but that's not your focus. And so in many ways, you're going to be tied down to trying to undo decades, maybe even centuries of unfortunate things that have been happening in your communities and to your family. And so the most that I can say by way of advice to any, you know, to, to, to um, students and alums is, you know, we have to really begin to seriously redefine what success is. Um, we cannot go by the definition that we've been handed. It doesn't work for us. And in fact, it is the reason why we've been living the lives that we've been living. And so I encourage everyone to really look deeply within them and continue to achieve, definitely. If you, if you can go and get yourself a high salary job with a lot of equity, go out there and get that. Um, it's what you do with that, with those resources that I, that I would love to challenge people to think critically about. And so uh, for me, I, I've been blessed. I, I've been very blessed. That's why I'm so grateful to the university. My life could have taken a totally different turn. And that's why I feel obligated to do as much as I can for anyone in need, because that's the only thing that, that helped me to get along and to move about. Thank you, Bert. Thanks. I'll, I'll ask the next question. We have a question um, from Brian Garreau, um, who is Associate Dean for the Corps, and Holly Vanderwall from the Philosophy Department. Um, appreciating Marina's comment that issues of race and inequality are, are ongoing and dynamic. So Ms. Smiley, in your view, what are some of the future directions you see Montserrat needing to move in in the near future? And they're wondering whether or not you see a need for more faculty and staff involvement. And what are some of the ways that professors and staff can support Montserrat students in the classroom and out? That was a very loaded question, but thank you. <laughs> All right, so let me start from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. So what the professors, can, uh, the faculty can do in their classroom is be a little bit more mindful. You know, I've heard time and time again that the Montreal students are there and they're expected to have everything the first day in terms of their material and the books and everything else. And it, it saddened, saddens my heart to know that there's not enough sensitivity there in, in that regard. And so when you, the faculty is teaching a class, being mindful of who, a student that is sitting in that class and may not have that book. It's not because they lost the book, it's because they can't afford the book and they're probably in the process of us trying to get the book. So it's just being mindful and, and being patient with those students that don't look like the typical student. We, I am so grateful that many of the faculty thus far has come, come forth and has given me their extra copies so, you know, with the help of Billy Sue in your office, Akua, that we've gotten a letter out to the different, you know, faculty saying that there's, Montserrat is now there, we need your help. So in the past, we've definitely gotten that support. So that's, that's one question. So the other question was, who I really need you to repeat the, the second. Yeah, um, no, I think that that answered a lot of it. They want to know okay. how, um, oh, what direction are, do you see Montserrat going in? Um, what are some of the other things you see for the future of Montserrat? Okay, that's a great question. For me, I feel that the, the, we are very limited in, in, in terms of resources, in terms of funding. I know the budget is very small, and I have highlighted a couple of the resources, and just to name a few tonight, and my, my hope and dream and my prayer is that I can get a little bit more money to take care of our students. For example, Did we lose Yvonne? Yeah, I think at least I've lost her. Have you lost her too? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Marina, I, why don't, yeah, Marina, well, why don't you add that, add? Yeah, I'd like to just add that for a professor who may not be acquainted within their university, sure. some of the struggles that a student may be facing if they were quote unquote Montserrat, I would just start within your own specific environment. 
and try to understand what makes a successful student and what's going to set a student for, up for success beyond the university. So if you're a pre-med pre -med student, you're going to need to have clinical, um, clinical work to make you a great candidate for med school. But those jobs are unpaid. So how do you connect students to those jobs and find the resources to pay them so that they can participate? And that looks different for each individual type of student. So a CSOM student, so a business school student is gonna have different requirements than a literature student or somebody who's doing linguistics or something that's different. So it doesn't have to be super personal and, and a student shouldn't have to self identify and you can work with your financial aid office or whatever office in your university to help you support these students within your own um, subject because there's so much you can do to empower through mentorship so i know in my experience it was mentorship that changed the trajectory by participating in programs at boston college of my life and if I hadn't had that mentorship or connectivity, which a lot of these students don't understand or don't know why mentorship is so important, it's a soft social skill that if you don't come from a certain background, you don't necessarily know how to achieve because you're taught from a very early age to not ask for help because that's a weakness. So for whatever anybody, any university or any department that somebody's in, Try to first understand what makes a student successful and then meet them where they're at in their own experience and then reach them there. That would be my, my hope for any, because any person there could, in any department, in any university could be a resource for students. And I'll just add and finish that, that we've gotten to the point now where a lot of the professors and now in their syllabus, if they, they request, if you're a Montserrat student, you're able to check off a box. So that also helps us as well. And I always share with the uh, faculty and the teachers that if there's a student in their, uh, in their classroom that they see that needs help, just reach out to us. So just to back up what Marina said, it's, you know, it's we, meeting us halfway. Not all the faculty understand what we do, but now that we've got a little bit more relationship with them, it's working a little bit more smoothly. Thank you, Marina. I've got a question here from uh, uh, Kwasi uh, Sardoka Mensa from the BC Libraries. He says, it's good that BC has a program such as Montserrat. I'm sure that there are many institutions that may not have something similar to Montserrat. How can we get other institutions to have programs like this? And maybe Juan, you, as a trustee, could you, could you take a stab at that one? Sure. Um, so that's a great question. And hello, my good friend. Haven't seen you in a while. Great question. So what I would say to that is, you know, uh, this is the kind of innovation that BC is becoming very famous for, right? We credit Marina with, with, starting, with starting us off on the Montserrat Collision, but we also have in that pantheon of great eagles, right? We have Valerie Lewis mostly, Alfred Feliciano. We have the, the, um, the students who started the Black Studies program. BC has always been, BC had, had um, the first uh, the first in kind black studies program in the United States. And most people don't know that. Um, so I, I, I welcome the question. And I really, what I would say is that we, we should really think long and hard about that. And I think where we begin is with our own sister Jesuit institutions. Um, you know, Georgetown, um, we can, we can partner with these, with these uh, universities and begin the dialogue and see where they are. Because, you know, we, as Marina mentioned, and as Ms. Smiley can attest to, we're, we're not quite there just yet, but we do have a formula here that we, can, that we can, you know, export to other places and let them know that it's doable. All the resources are in place. And also let them know that there is a greater probability of success in having these, these, all these um, different resources coming together and creating a culture that really allows these ingredients to work because that, that's that, more than anything, that's really gonna be the, the great determinant of success. Can you achieve a, a, a community, a culture around the community that allows for these things to go on? And so in answering Kwasi's question, I would, I would, I would say that I would, 
in, in, in strategizing around this, I think it's a great idea. I think we should engage in our leadership as a global Jesuit Catholic institution. We should start that dialogue. And I think we begin with our sister, our sister institutions and then go from there. Thanks. Thank you, Juan. Um, I'm looking, we probably have time for another uh, question. Um, we have a question here um, from, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw a question pop up from your daughter, Yvonne. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, there's a question from um, uh, John McGraw. Um, and he's and he's works in the IT department, and um, he says I've had the privilege for the last two years of being a mentor in the Montserrat Dinner Club, mm -hmm. which is a terrific experience for everyone involved. And he's wondering what are some of the other ways, sort of day to day ways, that um, uh, BC staff can show that we stand with and support Montserrat students. Is that question directed to me, Akua? Sure. Or? Why don't Why don't we direct that to Yvonne? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Akua, and thank you, John. A pleasure to see you tonight. Thank you. And he has been a great mentor for the two years that he's with us. And I would just like to interject by saying, when we were, when we had to evacuate the um, university, he was very instrumental in helping our students um, get the online capacity so a lot of students left and didn't and weren't able to get internet service john was very instrumental him and his staff doing that so i applaud you highly john for taking care of our students thank you so much so in regards to your question what i would say is continue to be that mentor um i always told students that my black and brown uh, young babies that it doesn't have to have doesn't have to be someone that looks like you we always assume that a person that is Caucasian has a better story than ours. And John has been with us and he shared our story. And I tell our students to be uncomfortable to get comfortable. It's okay to share your story because you wouldn't believe that the person that you're sharing your story with is a person that has a similar story to yours. So mentorship is very crucial and especially to our Montserrat students. And they appreciate knowing that people on campus, faculty, staff, administrators are making themselves available for that, especially at a time like this. So I would say continue being mentorships and anyone else that you know of, invite them to be our mentors. And I would also like to say that we also have um, about over 300 alumni that has taken time out to be also mentors to our Montserrat students. So we have that a platform as well that we're sharing with our students and again anyone that's willing and open to spending time with our students by all means come our way Great. I, would like, I would like to give marina just one last question since uh, uh you've been so instrumental in this program um you've often said that bc sets a high bar uh we're a very ambitious school we try to be to live up to very high ideals but we don't always make it we're a human institution What's one thing that you would like to see change about Boston College institutionally that would better serve Montserrat students? Wow, that's such a big question. Well, I did already mention student debt. Um, the way that we handle student debt nationally and at Boston College, it does not take the approach of equity uh, and inclusivity to students. We are a, a need blind, meet full need university, which is incredible. It does allow for so many students like myself to attend Boston College and, and have an amazing experience. And it's beyond what a lot of other universities have and can offer. So already we are doing a great job, but there are some policies that still require students, even if they're, they have high financial need, they're still required to take loans because the university thinks that it's a way to make an investment in your future and you're showing your commitment. And I personally feel that students who can pay and are full pays and can have the privilege of attending Boston College, um, they're not required to make that same commitment. They're not required to take out student loans that are their own 
to, to make that investment in their education. So I personally feel that even though that can be very small, depending on your financial need, um, for me, it was about $10,000 per year. So you can still leave with $40,000 and it's not a lot, but one thing that Juan mentioned is that a lot of the same struggles and inequalities that you're facing during your time at BC don't go away after BC is gone and you still have pressure to support your family or you go back into unstable environments where you do have food insecurity. So all these elements mean that students are still not getting an equitable support from the university in, in graduating debt-free. Can we do that yet? No, um, I don't believe so in the terms of what our endowment can provide and the financial aid that we currently have as an institution. Can we, the community, endow Montserrat and can someday Montserrat students give back to more Montserrat students so that they graduate debt-free? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I will be working for that tirelessly in the future. <laughs> but I do think that as an institution, we can do so much more to build a fair and equitable and just society, whether that's here in the Boston community or at any other Jesuit institution or the world at large. And me personally, I think that in having students participate in the university in all these programs is how we get to support them to get to the next level and to hopefully have what happened to me happen to them, which is have a, you know, you're lit on fire, you want to change the world, you want to make something better and you want to serve others. And that's, you know, that's the hope of everything we do, right? It's to serve students holistically for them to discover who they want to be in the world and how they're going to serve others. So ideally, personally, it would be graduate debt free if you qualify for it, if you're a Pell Grant student. And then the secondary would be to continue to, especially today in everything we've seen, to continue to be open to the stories that people in our community have to share, even when they're hard, even when they're difficult, and even when we don't necessarily know what the solution is, the first step is to come to the table and come together and hear those stories. And I'm, I'm hopeful that because BC is an amazing institution full of amazing people, like everybody who's tuned in today and all of you who are here today, that we can take steps forward toward that. Well, I just want to thank all of you. Um, Peter Hans Kolbenbach, who was the former Superior General of the Jesuits, he always said the best way to measure how an institution like BC is doing as a Jesuit place is to look at the alums. And all three of you graduated from BC. Uh, there's a lot of degrees represented on, on this screen right now. Uh, and I think by that measurement, uh, you are all uh, men and women for others. You really uh, demonstrate that in your life at work, but also in what you do for Boston College uh, as alums, as a trustee associate, as on-campus leaders, past and present. I just want to say thank you for a remarkable conversation and for being here tonight. Thank you, guests, and thank you, Bert, as well. And I just want to um, give a preview for our next segment, which will be on the Peace Corps. We will have three alums that are, uh, were former Peace Corps volunteers, and the host will be Brian Garreau, um, Professor of Sociology, and Tara Pisani Garreau, Professor of the Environmental Studies Program, also former Peace Corps volunteers. Remember that you need to register for each segment that you want to attend. Registration is very brief, but each segment has a different webinar link. So it's important to check out the webpage bc.edu backslash show at six to see the next segments. And while you are there, you can check out our archives where all of the previous segments are posted. Be well and stay safe. Good night from Boston College. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good night.